Hello, hello. Somebody could please help me gather those that are outside in the hallway and bring them back in. That would be great, please. Herding of the cats. See, so Akut will start here in just a second. Wow, it got very quiet very quick. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, so this next section is about the, the courses and the design and things like that. So Yakut is going to drive the, the slides uh, in this section as well as the, the closing section. Uh, but just like before, we're going to chime in with, with each other. So the stage is yours. Thank you, Nelson. You can hear me well? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so welcome back after your short break. Um, as, as Nelson mentioned, this is the section we put together a lot of different topics that we normally spend um, quite a bit of time when we um, do our Degrees at Scale Symposium. Uh, and I understand many of you in the room are my colleagues operating in this in the same space. So I will try to keep it brief and highlight the things that I think are unique um, without going into details. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Um, Okay, now I am not able to advance my slides, which is great. So let's see if this works. Yes. You want me to advance? Oh, no, you got it. I got it. I, th I think this will work now. Um, so one of one of the things that I I heard is when movies first invented, folks took their um, cameras to live theater, and then started shooting, and that's that's how the very first movies were created. And obviously, you know, that expanded the opportunity for folks to benefit from, um, you know, those actors and stories and whatnot. Uh, but as we, as we saw um, Hollywood or film industry improve over the course of, you know, more than 100 years or whatnot, we now see on the screen the things that are Im not imaginable, right? Um, the movie industry came to a place where um, they are not just shooting live um, acts on the stage, they are um, making things happen that we hope never actually happen. Um, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of effort, but um, that's, that's where, that, where that industry is. Um, when, I, when I look at where we are with online education, um, I see a combination of both of these approaches. I think, you know, I mentioned earlier, we have seven distance learning degrees, um, and they are operating on the premise that the student, uh, the, the faculty members are not expected to do anything different we have uh, 15 distance learning capable classrooms where uh, we lecture the capture uh, capture the lectures of um, these these faculty members. I have people in those um, rooms that are uh, supporting the faculty members. So we are benefiting from the high end research um, that our faculty produce without creating a lot of extra work for them. And that's how we have been operating for many many years. Now, uh, with Georgia Tech starting to do MOOCs and, and um, shortly after the, the at scale online programs, we now are, are shifting our focus to benefiting from the media and the capabilities to, to, in, a, in a different way to, to create learning opportunities for students that represent the shift that you see on the screen from a, a live capture to you know, making unimaginable happen, hopefully in a positive sense, not in a catastrophic sense. Um, so my team is um, composed of an instructional designer, media producer, and graphic designer teaming up with the faculty member to, to make these courses uh, work. So in all of our courses, that's the team um, that we start with. Um, whenever we have an, an ability to work with a teaching assistant during this design and development process, we try to benefit from that. There's a, there's a uh, that asterisk there because that doesn't always happen. Um, but whenever it happens, we see great progress in those courses because whenever we don't, we don't have a chance to work with the faculty member or they're busy or they're traveling, we continue to work with a subject matter expert to, to move things forward. The underlying thought is um, doing everything we can to reduce the load of the, off of the faculty members so that they can focus on the subject matter expertise that our teams do not have. The process that we follow is a formal kickoff that the academic programs unit of our uh, organization 
actually leads. So there's an associate dean for academic um, programs and student services um, here at Georgia Tech Professional Education. So his team is uh, the lead for um, all of these projects. And they arrange the kickoff with the faculty member, typically six to eight months before um, the, the start the course start date. If this is a brand new course that was not taught before, there is curriculum development involved. So we do expect a nine to 12 month. Um, but all of you will know that these are ideal situations and we always have departures from these ideals. And there are times, unfortunately, that we are trying to create a course as it is being taught. Those are minimal and we try to minimize those. And the moment we see that that is likely to happen, we raise all sorts of red flags for the postponement of that course. but. Um, there are times that we have to do that. Uh, we follow a pre-production, post-production, uh, production and post-production process. Now, until I came to this job, um, this, these would not be the uh, terminologies that I would use to describe the process, but, um, and I'm trying to shift away from this in this operation, a lot of what we do seems to be impacted by the video production aspect of, um, of the course development. So. Um, the production is what takes place in the studio. Pre-production is everything before, and post-production is everything else. Pre-production so, is actually where instructional design happens. So a lot of storyboarding, working with faculty on alignment, um, course develop, um, course objectives, what technologies to use, what assessments to create, and all sorts of you know the, the real design. So um, Yarku, let me jump in there real quick. It's also sure. a role that I play and my fellow deans play in, in staying in touch with the faculty that are in this process. Because the analogy that I use is this is kind of like writing a textbook. You work with the publisher and the publisher gives you a timeline when the book needs to be due and you sign a contract and all those other kinds of things. Um, just stopping in as dean to the faculty member's office, how's it going? and asking some leading questions and staying engaged. You know, I'm trying to learn too as Dean. You feed me what's happening. Knows that you're watching and that helps this process stay in tune. The other thing that we've added to this team or, or are in the process of adding is project management. So right now the IDs are doing it to make sure we stay on track because there's a launch date for that course where students are expected to come from that budget model and we better be ready. Yes, thank you. Um, and you know, you, you all are probably very familiar with the faculty uh, struggles during this design process because many faculty, and you know, I am one too, um, really focus on this is the content that I want to deliver, this is what I want to teach, this is what I want to cover. And the design process really starts at the end. You know, what is it, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? How do we know we get there? Uh, what are the assessments to, to tell us that you know, we get there? And then let's backtrack that from that what are what is the content? What are the activities? What are the technologies? And there is a lot of uh, struggle. And I actually had formal requests from academic program directors to really go with the flow and let the faculty, you know, bring in their content and teach. We do, in fact, do that. We do ask for their existing content, but we try to um, because I mean, if you start with the content, you will never have alignment. You will end up somewhere else. The alignment really happens if you have the um, end, end, end in mind and go from there. But that is um, by far the most difficult thing that the faculty um, try to adjust to. And once they go through the process, they all come out of it and saying, you know, my course is much better. And then, you know, how can I implement these things in other courses? But the process itself um, can, can become very painful for them. So um, one thing that we do at, at Georgia Tech, and this didn't happen with the computer science program at the start because Udacity took, took on a lot of these, um, these tasks, but today um, the, our, our in-house learning design and production team um, does all of our courses on the degree and non-degree side, online courses. Um, as I mentioned before, we have over 40 years of experience in teaching and learning at a distance. The ID team itself has seven uh, positions. Um, we have an instructional technology team. These are uh, people with ID and production skills um, uh, stitched together. Uh, we have five producers, uh, a graphic designer, a digital learning support specialist. And this, this is the team that primarily works on our um, at scale and other online programs. There are 20 plus more people in other support roles in my organization. Um, from AV support to um, people in the classrooms that um, help faculty with um, 
uh, lecture capture activities. So overall, you know, all, all parts of this organization contribute, but then the, the real work really happens with the you know, ID and uh, producer and instructional technologist team. So an we interesting aspect also oh, from, from an HR standpoint is how can we take those individuals that have been supporting our older models and get them into the newer models? So this is also a career pathing exercise that we're trying to navigate through uh, a, as a university. So I'm always espousing to you know the workforce, you know, upskill your employees. We need to drink our own medicine. Yes, and we will talk about this a little bit at the final section as well. Uh, we have two black box studios. I'm in one of them. Um, we have a one self-service studio, an audio studio, and a studio with a light board that we're uh, constructing, plus 15 distance learning equipped classrooms across campus. So um, I'm sitting next door to this master control facility. Um, all of these are live connections to those 15 classrooms. So when we capture something, I have folks um, in those classrooms, I have folks sitting in this room doing um, real-time uh, quality control. But let me emphasize, this is not the model behind our um, at degrees at scale. Um, our degrees at scale is based on this other model. So the, the gentleman who is sitting there, I'm sitting in that same seat right now next to a control uh, unit. And then my, my colleague is sitting there and helping me with that. You, too bad you can't see him. Um, so we follow a, a robust instructional design process before we bring faculty in the studio uh, to capture them. And here is another shot of the studio. This is one of our um, amazing professors in our Scheller College of Business. Um, a, a lot of times faculty do want to come to the studio right away, um, but then we do everything we can to stop that from happening. Because what, what happens when, the, when there are you know, very few times that we have to l let that happen. Um, it's a lot of you know retakes, post processing, um, because this is not the place where you can really um, wing it. You have to come in very prepared uh, to be able to create those tidbits. One thing that we do in the d instructional design process, and I think there is a related question in the Slido um, area about this. In fast-growing fields like cyber or computer science or analytics, one thing that we really try to deliberately do is, you know, what is static information that is going to be able to be out there for three or more years uh, versus what is fa fa fast changing? We try to make sure that what we capture is going to stand the test of time for a little bit because otherwise, you know, we're here reproducing the same course over and over again every single time. So. Um, we also have an, an audio booth. This is similar to the audiologist um, uh, rooms that you see in doctor's offices sometimes, um, because we don't need to do hit, hit, hit shots uh, for all courses. There are times that we can just be fine with um, desktop um, captures. So this is an area that we do use for those kinds of activities. Sometimes it's a quick fix that can be done uh, using a you know, much smaller studio environment with good soundproofing. Um, with just scrap equipment laying um, around, we were able to put together a self-service studio. We say self-service, but we do give a quick orientation to what's in here. The idea is for faculty members to just use their um, ID cards to come in here and do either um, you know rehearsing or create some um, you know, video tid tidbits themselves. Um, this is a, a, at a no cost to our faculty members because everything else is costly, right? When, when I do this in the studio, there's someone watching me, helping me. Um, we, try to, we try to create a no cost solution for faculty if they are interested in these innovative things. And you will see, I mean, it has everything. It has a, the only thing we had to purchase here is that green screen in the back. Everything else was our excess equipment that we were keeping as backup. Um, a teleprompter, an audio mixer, a confidence monitor, and a, and a full desktop set up there for them to use. Our, our course design and development process is nicely laid out here, and of course, it's never pretty like this. Um, I'll be the first one to admit to that. Um, but we basically go through a robust design process where um, we work with faculty as closely as we can with the time that they can allow us. And then we go into production 
Um, and then we have a quality assurance piece where um, we do the quality reviews for the, the video content as well as the platform build. I mentioned earlier, we are now operating with the mindset that the very first time the, the, the course is offered is still a part of our production process, uh, similar to a beta test. And um, during that time, the, the instructional designer that is responsible for the course production stays very close to the course, very, very close to the faculty member. Uh, we, we monitor course forums as well as the you know, very many channels that the students um, use to talk about the course and we try to bring as much of that information as possible to the course design process to make improvements. Um, and as we mentioned before, uh, all courses are um, scheduled to do refreshes in three years, um, but it varies. There are courses in the uh, computer science program that didn't go through a refresh yet, and there are courses that um, after the first or second round, we had to redo. So there are, there are very few cases of that, but we had to redo it because we weren't really um, getting what we wanted out of those courses. Um, copyright is one of our major concerns, um, just like everybody else, but there are a few nuances that I think I should highlight. Um, as Nelson mentioned, all of our com computer science courses are on Udacity, available to the world. Um, quite a few of our analytics courses are, um, the content is available on edX. In fact, there is a MicroMasters that feeds into our um, degree program. There's a pathway from non-credit to, to credit, and I think we need to highlight that. Uh, so it's three of our uh, courses in the analytics degree are bundled together to form a, what edX calls a MicroMasters. Um, and so all the content for those three courses are out there. We, we teach those courses the same way we teach the, uh, the degree courses, same faculty, same TA, same, same assessments. And then if, they, if folks uh, finish one of those courses and then get admitted to the degree through the proper channels of Georgia Tech, they have, a, they have an ability to bring those courses to, to, their, uh, to their record um, through an advanced standing process. So I, I highlight this because what this means is um, our content is not necessarily behind closed doors. Um, it is out there. So it, it brings a lot of an, an additional level of scrutiny to the, the content or the, the graphics or whatever we use in these courses. Um, because there may be, um, a, 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 there, is, there is an ability for us to use or benefit from public domain, fair use, teach act kind of um, abilities. Um, but it's, it only happens if you are behind um, password protection and you're able to do this for the duration of a semester and then um, students do not have access to that content anymore. If, you, if, if your content is out there like we do, um, and then once students have access to it, they have perpetual access to like, you know, their edX courses and edX content. We have to be very careful with what we record and what we use in those courses. We had different uh, approaches to to this, we made it the primary responsibility of the instructional designer. Then we said maybe it's primary responsibility of the graphic designer. Um, but then we always found, um, you know, hiccups, right? Um, we found later on that things that we should have caught in the beginning, uh, and we, we missed those things. Now it is everybody's responsibility to be very mindful of copyright, just like accessibility. Um, so all course team members need to be uh, looking out for um, you know, the use of copy, what seems to be copyrighted material and ask questions. And um, there, are, there are times that we have to go back to courses that uh, we, um, we produced and then make tweaks because we identified some copyright concerns. Um, this is especially hard for faculty to buy into because you know, they say, I use it in my face-to-face -face classes, or this is the course textbook, and I always use these graphics from the textbook in my class, and I put it in my PowerPoints, and I never had an issue. Uh, it's just you know, steering them from that conversation to you know, this is out there for others to see um, is, is something that um, we learned to do. Quality is a big uh, aspect of our conversations. Um, just like you know, many of you do, uh, we, we follow a quality rubric, which is Quality Matters, and I know um, the SUNY system has its own uh, very robust OSCAR um, rubric. 
Um, we use the rubric in the creation of the templates that we use for course design and delivery. Um, we also use it to assist us in the non-credit space, um, the continuing and professional ed rubric standards. Um, University System of Georgia is a quality matters institution, so we are all under the umbrella of um, the same quality, um, you know, quality rubric and, and peer review process. Um, I think we can do better here. A lot of times um, we are in such fast production process that there is little time to pause and look at what we do. And that's one of the reasons why that first run of the course is so important. The beta test is so important for us to catch some of those things. Um, and then our technology in environment is so complex, and I'll, I'll mention that in a, in a few slides later. Um, it's easy to make mistakes. So um, I, I constantly think about ways to maybe dedicate you know, an individual resource to just looking at quality, but I don't have that luxury right now. Um, in, in addition to obviously using rubrics as accredited institutions, we do things just we have to do things to make sure that the quality of uh, delivery independent of the modality is is equivalent so um, the the quality of the end of course grades um, you know same faculty members same experience I mean we do all those things but I want to go back to the conversation in the morning um, one thing that I think you know surprisingly um, positive is the quality of our students um, having you know VPs or C uh, chief technology officers in your in your cohort, uh, having people with you know 20 plus years of experience and bringing all that um, knowledge and experience to the course discussions, these these things have a lot uh, of bearing uh, on on quality. Uh, the the kind of conversations that take place in our uh, Piazza forums, that's the tool that we use in our online courses, is incredible. I mean there are. I think one of our faculty members was saying it's six weeks into the class and I have 10,000 um, posts in the, in the Piazza forum. So, and it also makes TAs essential to the process because somebody needs to watch the, those conversations. Uh, a lot of times we need to do some, um, like what does this look like? Especially for faculty members who've never done this before, uh, we need to provide them some examples. And I don't think those examples are very um, useful to to the audience there. Uh, but just to you know show you, this is one of the OMSCS courses. Um, Dr. Leo Mark, who is our associate dean here at GTPE, and this is uh, this is the Udacity environment. Um, we also have um, an edX example here. The idea is the same. There's content, um, text-based text content, there's, there's videos, and then there are activities related to each video. So one thing that we try to do is, there is not a, there's not a video in these courses longer than 15 minutes. We try to keep it at six minutes, um, but then sometimes it's just not happening. So, but no, no more than 15 minutes. And there's always an, an inter interactive activity um, about the, the video that they watch. Uh, all of our videos are captioned. Um, we use Kaltura via Kaltura campus. Kaltura has a machine level captioning for everything that you put uh, out there. Um, but then for the at scale programs, we also do a human level captioning. So these are sent out for um, a human being to, to caption the, the videos. So um, those are the typical examples, and we have you know, more futuristic, more innovative, and you know, somehow, to, to some extent, you know, examples that make us really excited. Um, so this is Dr. Ashok Gold. Um, he created an AI TA, I think two years ago now, um, named Jill Watson in one of his classes. This is a Chronicle of Higher Education article that highlights the technologies that are going to define higher education uh, in the 21st century, and his, his work was highlighted. Um, Jill Watson was um, since introduced into this class without anybody knowing that um, that's, a, that's a robot. And this was an artificial intelligence class, so it's very fitting. Um, and then students did not know, so the, the robot passed the Turing test. Uh, and since then, uh, Ashok created variations of this uh, TA. Um, as Nelson, Nelson pointed out earlier, this TA really learns from previous discussions, previous discussion boards, and everything that's shared. 
and then um, answers questions based on what, um, in this case, she knows. Um, and then if there's a question that was never asked before, that's when it, it starts um, struggling. Um, it's very useful because in a lot of cases, a large amount of discussions that take place in the discussion board are you know, classroom management types of questions, right? Where do I find this? How do I submit this? Um, where do I go to do this? Um, what's my grade and whatnot? So they're not necessarily subject matter expertise related questions. They take a lot of time. So uh, solutions like this are promising to take off some of that load um, and you know, I'll help us scale. Uh, and then Ashok is also working on variations of this TA as a research assistant. So how would this look like if somebody does your uh, literature survey for you at the you know, click of a, of a mouse or something? Um, and then how would this benefit us um, when we talk about student services, advising, um, career counseling types of activities. So um, this is a very promising technology that uh, we're excited about. Um, the learner engagement piece in our um, courses is mainly carried out by the TAs in the direction of faculty. We have a 1 to 50 TA student ratio. Um, the learner engagement, um, there, there are variations. It's very hard to standardize um, what faculty want to do. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise to you. Um, but we, we recommend real-time office hours, and many of the uh, courses do this. And during these office hours, they uh, either take students, uh, student questions ahead of time and go through that list of questions. Um, all of these office hours are um, recorded because we have students all over the world and uh, we make these available to students. Um, they also hold Q&A uh, sessions ahead of uh, exams or major um, assignments. And they also do exam debriefs, uh, going over the exam questions to make sure that uh, students understand their mistakes and they don't repeat them again. Learner engagement in an asynchronous way happens in course forums. Um, in all of our courses, we have um, Piazza course forums that are used for subject matter related or otherwise uh, uh, course conversations. But um, we know that students also created their own forums. There are over 50 of them using Google+, Reddit, um, Slack. Um, whenever we find an existence of one, we try to keep an eye on them um, just to be sure that we are um, holding the pulse of the students and bring that information back to our design process or um, review process. But then let's face it, there are a lot of things that are um, happening out there that we don't know. Um, and we had quite a few conversations around, do we, do we participate in those conversations that the students have in the student run forums or do we just hold back? Um, so we try to make sure that the information that we share officially are in our official forums. And quickly we, we learned that, you know, you say something in an email to a student, it is going to end up in those student-run forums somewhere. So we try to be very mindful of um, sharing information uh, with individual students um, and treating it as if it's going to go out to, to the world. And I mentioned there are some really rich discussions in these uh, forums, students helping each other as well. So. Um, and in fact, um, when a course is taught for the first time, faculty members really pay attention to those discussion forums and try to see who is taking a lead in conversations, who is trying to help others understand topics, who is trying to um, hold others' hands uh, and trying to help them be successful. And those are really good candidates for either future TA positions or greater positions, and um, that's been really successful. Yeah, I could, let me jump um, in with one to, other oh, thing. Go ahead. Those rich forums, not in our degree programs, but out on the open ones, <clears throat> we're also starting to hear from employers that they're putting some of their subject matter experts in, not to take the course, but to mine for future employees. So might this be another avenue for recruiting and revenue streams that we work with companies in terms of employment capabilities and use that for new job placement activities? So the whole thing that we do is higher ed, how do we find ways to do things differently? Thank you. I want to spend just a little bit of time on 
I, I mentioned that we have a really um, complicated technology or complex technology environment. Uh, online Master of Science and Computer Science started out as a, as a relationship or as a partnership with Udacity. Um, but then Udacity only uh, delivered the videos. So this is just a snapshot of um, student-facing um, platforms and technologies that make OMSCS run. And there are all sorts of other ones that are not student-facing. Um, and you will see that you know, it takes quite a few different types of technologies to, to make this um, course delivery happen. And the similar uh, situation is with um, analytics. This is analytics, but cyber security is very similar to this. So it is a partnership with edX, but you will see that the pink areas are edX. Um, edX is really where we deliver the videos. And a lot of um, what happens is through Canvas, through Piazza for discussions, um, and midterms and finals are typically on Canvas with a few exceptions. And grade books are on Canvas because that's what's, what integrates with our banner system for um, grades to be submitted. So. Um, Whenever we offer, so we create a course and then we offer it for the second time. We have to not only copy over the Canvas section, we also have to create an edX section for, um, for the videos to be offered. And then that edX section for the MicroMasters classes really has three types of students, an audit student, so open, open education learner um, that accesses the course for free, uh, a verified student, that needs to be, you know, their, their identity needs to be verified and they need to take proper examinations for them to be able to get a certificate, and a degree student. So there is, there is a lot of work that goes into just copying over and making the course available for a second run and making sure that everything works. Uh, and that's one of the things that we didn't anticipate at the, at the outset and we had to tweak because there is, there is work involved and there's cost involved in, in those activities. Let me talk about some of the challenges. Uh, some of these are really uh, in the weeds technology challenges, uh, but they're, they're worth mentioning. Gradebook on edX versus Canvas are two different beasts. Um, those of you who have been in the field for over 20 years may remember the first days of WebCT 1.0 and then the WebCT 2.0 and all the struggles and pains that we all went through as that platform improved itself to, to what it is today as Blackboard. So some of the things that we experience with edX are um, they, they really resemble the first days of a, of a platform company. Um, I mean, granted, when edX and Coursera and Udacity started, they really were focusing on the content delivery at scale, right? And then um, allowing students to um, take exams at scale without human intervention. They weren't really designed to offer a full-fledged um, course program, a program on their platform. So one thing that you cannot do, for example, on edX uh, gradebook is add a column. And it's so typical. I mean, there are so many reasons why you want to manually add a column to a gradebook. You cannot export and import a gradebook. So these are some of the things that we are struggling with um, when we have these two platforms uh, talking to, to each other. It especially becomes a problem when you have a MicroMasters group and the degree group and the experience and everything needs to be same. The MicroMasters group is using edX's gradebook that has different intricacies and it doesn't really match with what we're doing in the Canvas gradebook. Some of the accessibility features are not too robust and we have been able to work around this because we use Canvas as the main platform on the degree side, but then on the non-degree side where we use edX for those MicroMasters students, for example, um, but there are some things that we are not able to do, and we're working very closely with edX to address those. Integrations is another um, aspect. Whatever tool that we use, for example, proctoring tool, we have to integrate it in both platforms. And then, you know, edX, by the way, has a different plat um, proctoring solution that, that they want to use on the MicroMaster side. But then we have our degree side for the proctoring solution. So every single tool, yes, is another example. Uh, we have to think about these integrations in multiple ways. Um, the other challenge is, I mean, because all of these people, you know, faculty and TAs and students, they're all really capable people and living in the middle of all the technology solutions. 
um, they really reach out for the technology that defines their user case the best, that ser serves their uh, purpose the best, independent of what our recommendations are. So we have a variety of things that are being used for our live synchronous sessions. And um, we seem to not have a way to control that. And I'm not really convinced that it is something we can control. But it is a very important piece of the student experience. So you know, conversations are needed to um, at least you know, focus on maybe a couple of them instead of you know, all sorts of stuff. And every time somebody uses a, a tool that is outside of the Georgia Tech realm, um, there are all sorts of issues that we need to be careful with. FERPA, accessibility, um, GDPR, you know, where does this data reside? Um, and in terms of discussion tools, I mean, Canvas has a, has a very robust discussion tool. But then um, because we are a relatively new Canvas institution, this is our second year as um, Canvas. Before that, there was a homegrown Sakai-based um, learning management system that didn't have a very good uh, forum capability. That's when Georgia Tech faculty adopted um, Piazza Forum. So that ship is like, you know, moving really fast. And it's really near impossible to move that ship away from um, that Piazza Sea and bring it back to Canvas. But it is, again, you know, one of those cases where integration is important, um, loading those students into those Piazza Forums and then the ability to remove them and they drop the course because that's a purple issue. So um, there are some challenges around that. Another challenge we have is, you know, we have multiple programs, multiple shells, you know, there are edX shells and uh, Canvas shells, and then multiple business models. OMSCS business model is a little um, different than um, analytics and cyber. Um, one is less than $7,000, the other is less than $10,000. But then increasingly we see faculty and students interested in um, cross enrollment. So we have OMSCS courses that are offered. We actually have one course that is offered on all three programs. Um, so you not only do you have different business models, you also have you know, this course that has this uh, videos on Udacity. And now if we want to offer it to analytics students, that needs to be converted to edX and uh, do uh, interesting things with Canvas because faculty really want to do to want, go to one place. So how do we architect uh, those selective releases? Um, a lot of work is involved uh, in just taking one course and making it available to, to multiple programs. And just the, the challenges of content types in different edX um, tracks. Um, we also have the challenge of uh, creating a course for the spring semester and then a lot of these courses are offered throughout the year. We shorten it for the summer semester, and then there are always improvements that take place. And then we offer it again for the fall semester, and then that, be that course becomes a larger course, so there's still design work involved. So the cycle never ends. So I find my instructional designers, I mean, they have these trails of children. Like they created a course two years ago, and it's still their responsibility because you know there's just so much work involved in making these semester to semester works happen. We also figured out or um, over time discovered there are things that do not scale from just a pedagogy and andragogy perspective. Um, you really need to rethink your group assignments and peer review. What works for 20, 25 students may not work for these large groups of students. And there are also some favorite things that both faculty and students really like that do not scale. For example, one of our uh, professors implemented a three skip days rule in, in his course. So uh, everybody off the bat gets um, three skip days, meaning you know if I cannot submit my homework today, I can submit it tomorrow and use one of my skip days. And I can do this three times. Or I know that I have a business trip coming up and I cannot submit my exam. I have three skip days. It's a great practice. And people, res residential students love it. Online students loved it too the, the very first time. But there is not, nothing in place to keep track of these skip days. So the very first time the course was offered, it had 250 students, TAs used spreadsheets, and a lot of times under code. The second time, they decided to do away with the skip days because it just does not scale. And, and one of the things that we do a lot in online learning is just you know, introducing yourself in a discussion forum the very first week of the course, right? And then you expect people to respond to each other. That just does not work with, um, 
this many students in 250, 500 students, it just does not scale. As I mentioned, uh, knowing that students com uh, have conversations about our courses, about our faculty, and you know, many, many social media sites is, is a challenge to, to keep an eye out. Um, one of my challenges is attracting and retaining talent in my, in my instructional design and production teams. Uh, Atlanta is a very competitive market with so many companies just around us. Um, they have better pay and better um, career development opportunities um, and then career ladders. So we have, we constantly have um, vacancies. So we have programs being added and then we have constant um, vacancies. It's, it's a very hard, hard balance. And then we are a state institution. We have very slow business processes, both on the recruitment side and on the procurement side. There are things that we do want to do and act fast in, and we just cannot do it. And it's, it's, been, a, it's been a sore point. So um, I hope this was a useful introduction, and um, I'm happy to take some questions. So Yakut, I know you can't see the room, but there was a lot of head nodding taking place through your remarks. So you, you certainly resonated she can, she with many it. in the room. Yeah. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Two other points I just want to make real quick. Uh, one is uh, interoperability, and you heard uh, Yakut talk about those kinds of things with a number of systems that make up these ecosystems to, to run the programs. Uh, we're working now with IMS Global and trying to push for some standard of data interoperability. We would welcome others to join that conversation because trying to move things around in these systems is a nightmare as they get more complex. Second thing that I would just caution you about, and it's something that uh, may be unique to Georgia Tech, I'm not sure, uh, but has to do with export control. Uh, and there's two realms of export control. The one that most people think about is, you know, FAR and DOD. Uh, that there's certain knowledge that we have in this country that we're not supposed to export outside. And certainly when we launched cybersecurity, that was one that we spent a lot of time to make sure we were compliant uh, with those aspects. Uh, but the second aspect is Commerce Department and denied parties. And whether or not you're teaching somebody cybersecurity or to tie shoes, there are individuals of certain parts of the world that by our government's viewpoint, we cannot provide a service. And how do you know if they're in your classes or not? So every enrollment goes through a visual, pro a visual compliance, is the name of the software, it's a program from the government to check every enrollment on that database to make sure that we're compliant. So there's a lot of behind the scenes efforts that take place in these things that the average faculty member, and I would even say some of us have learned about uh, over the years to make sure that we're on the right side of compliance. Um, state authorization was another one that came up. NC Sarah, fortunately, has come along that's solved many of those issues, not all yet. Uh, but we live in a very challenged compliance world where some of the rules were from decades ago where technologies, you scratch your head, why is that still a policy? But it is. So with that, questions? So, Yakut, can you see the questions in the Slido or do you want me to um, uh, call them out? Because we have a few. No, I think I can. So let's okay. see. Do you leverage the, do you leverage the student body to uh, augment your course development teams? For example, use Georgia Tech students to yes. So we are trying to do that increasingly. Um, we do have very capable um, graphic design students that we uh, we bring in. Georgia Tech does not have a College of Education. So we don't really have a pool to choose from in terms of instructional designers. Um, but Georgia State is next door. So at least for the summers, we are able to bring interns. And in fact, last year's intern is now a full-time um, instructional designer on my team. Um, so we do benefit from that. Um, I, I wish we would do more of it. Um, and I think you know there are some opportunities. Uh, is what, One of the things that we try to do moving forward is um, reduce the the busy work on my instructional designers. I mean, they should not be cleaning up uh, faculty's PowerPoints, right? Um, move them towards a scenario where they're architecting, but they're also looking at data. So bring learning analytics more into the design process. You have and a lot I of people lot applauding of for that last comment. Uh, graduate students there. Um, so that's one. Um, did I hear you talking, uh, Nelson, or should I move to the next question? No, I just said you had a lot of people applauding when you said your ID shouldn't be cleaning up PowerPoints. The, the room almost came alive. 
it's easier said than done. Um, have you had a TA or a grader step away from the course mid-course, and how do you handle that? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it happened. Um, we don't really have visibility to that. That's, that really is taken care of by the faculty and the TAs. Um, our student services person, Jennifer Bully, probably has insights into it because he, she does the hiring. Um, I'm going to have to uh, find someone to get, get me that answer. Um, do you require all courses? Wait a second. I think there was another course, one that just disappeared. Do you require all courses meet the Quality Matters 85% standard? If so, do you maintain and scale Quality Matters expectations for faculty? So I've been at places where we had a more robust Quality Matters implementation. Um, the nature of our courses and our faculty, I don't think we're at a place where we can do you know, those kinds of peer reviews and courses meeting expectations uh, for 85% of the standard. I'm an academic advisor. Um, I'm on the academic advisory board for Quality Matters, so um, and I know what to what extent it can be implemented on a campus. What we have here, we have a course template that is based on Quality Matters rubrics. We have our instructional designers all trained with Quality Matters, and then we do as we produce these courses. We try to make sure that we follow the standards, so we don't have a proper peer review process that we go through. I don't see other questions on Slido, but it may just be because I'm on the stage and I'm just trying to, you know, quickly read. Can did, you, is there anything else? Yakut, did you answer questions? Yakut, can you hear me? Yes. Did you answer the question about how many courses does each ID work on at any given time? So that question disappeared. I initially saw it, but it's not here anymore. So that's a, that's a tough one to answer. We try to do um, two sometimes three new courses. But as I mentioned, I mean, these instructional designers have all of these courses that created they, they created in the past, and they have to still do some sort of delivery support. I'm trying to find a way to take that delivery support away from them, but we're not there yet. And there's, there are also times, you know, so the pre-production or the design process is very heavy involvement with the designer. Once the course starts in the production process, that load uh, reduces a little bit, leaving a little bit of time for the designer to, to work on other things. So there are times that um, the designer may have two courses. There are times that they may have four new courses. We try to balance that with the, with the staff that we have. And there's times they may be working on other MOOCs or other kinds of activities that are beyond That's right. the degrees so this is, of scale. Yeah, it's, it's a combination of degree and non-degree that we, we try to juggle. Other questions? Oh. One coming in the audience here in just a second. Okay, so I actually have two questions. My first question is, can you talk a little bit about the role of the faculty member during the course if the TA and the graders are working really closely with the students? And then I know that you said that it was considered like an overload. Is there any conversation about it being part of their teaching load? So I'll let the second part of the question for Nelson. Um, the first part of the question, so the, the faculty member is still the, the owner of the learning environment. Um, they still have, um, they still make the decisions on, for example, if um, a certain case is an academic integrity case. Um, so they still call the shots. They also weekly hold weekly meetings with their either head TA or the TA team, depending on how, how large that team is. Um, some faculty members do hold those um, uh, real-time sessions themselves, and students are actually very appreciative of that when that happens because they see the real faculty member involved in the course. Um, and then, you know, I have to tell you, we see variations of this, right? Some faculty members are really dedicated, and they're all in there. Um, doing everything, they even uh, read the you know Reddit's and Google Pluses, and they they sometimes they panic. They're they're saying these things about my course. So, um, but then the minimum that they do is they still make the big decisions in the course. They still hold those um, meetings with the TAs, um, make sure that all of those big issues are addressed by the TAs. Because ultimately, when a student complaint comes up, it goes to the faculty member. So they need to they need to be able to. Um, you know, take care of those issues. What they don't do is they don't go into each and every um, 
discussion board and read all the questions. Um, their, their TAs um, make sure that those big issues are addressed by the faculty member. And they assign the final grades, they submit the grades, they, they design the assessments, they, they do receive a lot of um, um, help from their TAs, just like the residential courses do, right? Um, but then they are the owners of the assessments and, um, and student learning. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so I, I would add one other thing to it. The faculty that are most engaged are also finding ways to tie in those discussion and personally who's in them and the companies they represent to the research. Uh, and that is a huge win in terms of getting faculty integration in a research institution when you have people from the world's top companies in your classes and you have to write a, a, a government grant that requires a letter of endorsement from a company and you have all these people in front of you, uh, that's a great win-win. Uh, and so uh, fa you see faculty stay engaged for those reasons. Plus the conversations are just very rich and they say, I never thought my research could be used that way. And it generates new research questions. Uh, so that's a nice mix between the research mission and the education mission uh, in institutions such as ours. Uh, your other question was about should the faculty workload move to be, or should the faculty go into a workload as opposed to an out of workload model. Those are the beginnings of those kinds of conversations. When should that happen? How would it happen? What, uh, et cetera. Uh, you gotta remember that by faculty vote, this is how the faculty voted for it to take place. And we need to be respectful of that also. Uh, at this juncture, I'm happy that I'm seeing the learning from these kinds of spaces impact our residential classrooms. Uh, and so that all students being served by Georgia Tech are, are getting the benefits and fruits of, of what it is that we're learning. And I think for right now, I'm okay with that. Uh, at some juncture, we're gonna have to wrestle with it. But our original budget model, when we put the first computer science one together, said that in three years, the tenure track faculty would no longer be teaching because they'd lose interest. We've not seen a single one lose interest and that says something else about the richness of this fora and how it ties in with their day-to-day -day activities and really their passion and drive to want to serve students. And that's a great thing to see also. So we've got to find the right incentive mechanisms, the right methodologies to make sure that that happens. But at the end of the day, the focus should be on the learner. And are we making sure they're getting the best possible outcomes from the resources that we put in front of them? And then we figure out things on the back end. So following up with the faculty and the workload, um, and you've been in this online spit or excuse me, distant space for 40 years. This is just a, a, a not a personally, but yes. Correct. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. The institution has, yeah, yeah. and this is a slightly different space in there. Um, how does a faculty members' participation in the scale or not scale um, impact their APT and? Um, how is it viewed in their, um, you know, the escalation through the ranks? Yeah, so we just had a very interesting conversation across the deans uh, just this week because we're nearing the end of that annual cycle of RPT uh, and, and whatnot. And the conversation was about how at the provost and dean's level the role of teaching is playing a more important role and how do we carry that message down into the ranks of the early parts of that tenure process or promotion process to make sure that the faculty are having the same weights. It's easy or the outside perception is it's a checkbox. You must be doing well, check. What else have you done for me lately? Uh, but it's becoming significant and when we see faculty members such as the Jill Watson uh, tying these things together with research activities, that's what our faculty should be doing. Uh, they have the active or they have the abilities to also include non-credit teaching in their dossier and CVs. Well, we have the same kind of uh, access to course evaluations and whatnot that you typically see in a standard credit side of the house. We're trying to make these things that if we're really going to be deliberate in our innovation for a lifetime education, all education that faculty do should be part of their CV and their mission space and that includes individual mentorship of doctoral students all the way down to uh, any other form. And so one of the interesting aspects of that report is new educational products. And we're a firm believer that this may be a new educational product, quote unquote, in the sense of its business model and cost structure, 
but we really believe that there has to be something else besides grad certificates, degrees, uh, non-credit, which really I don't like the term because non is a non-starter. Uh, how do we find new journey pathways and recognition for individuals? So, you know, there's a lot of work that you're doing in terms of micro-credentialing and badges and other kinds of things. Lumina has a great study going on in terms of all the different credentials that are out there and it's a plethora of stuff. Uh, how do we find ways where the world in which we work recognizes the quality of whatever credential it is that we want to issue uh, and we have those kinds of recognitions for what it is that people do? but it should be part of what faculty are, are judged upon. So, um, so uh, oh, go ahead, Yaka. Watching the time. <laughs> Kim, I was just been trying to be mindful of the time. Um, should, we, should we continue with the, the rest of the presentation and then uh, take some more questions? Yes, yep, good idea. And I think, Yaku, okay. some of these we can go through very fast because some have yes. been comments we've already made. Yes, yes. So this uh, final section, we, we want to spend some time talking.